When someone seeks to force an ideology into someone else or seeks to shield an ideology from criticism, they are also signaling they don't believe in its power in and of itself, and thus any lashing out to prove the ideology actually reinforces the absence of its power. Perhaps because the greatest power requires only the lightest touch. Impositions on spiritual beliefs by way of religious institutions or scientific ideologues, have so often constrained the follower and believer with unnecessary burdens of dogma. One religious school names it blasphemy to consider the tenets of the other school, even though in general they believe in the fundamentals, that consciousness is immortal, God exists, and light or goodness overcomes the dark and lies at the root of creation. To approach, therefore, certain traditions more established in Eastern religions is easier done if we shed dogmatism in favor of the more realistic view which does not fail to consider the universal beliefs established across numerous religions. Not being constipated by either the academic or religious dogmas, and considering that, like the sun, the one God must shine on all people with the same light, we have liberated ourselves once again to take a fresh look at another worldwide belief, an answer to the question of what options does a soul have upon shedding the mortal shell. As we will see, one such option, taught to the Hindus and Buddhists, and not absent from Egypt, Persia, or Greek philosophy, is reincarnation, defined as the birth of a soul into a new body. Now for those of us who yawn at the absurdity of this idea, let's consider how scientists, who you might revere, have no problem using inferential logic to explain the existence of, say, electrons, atoms, and dark matter. But have you ever tried to experience an electron? The same inferential logic that tells us the electron exists is the same flavor which leads philosophers to believe in the return of the soul to body and the pre-existence of that soul prior to birth. Except the scientific truth of the electron lacks the emotional or experiential knowingness that caused, say, Carl Jung, Emerson, Thoreau, Giordano Bruno, and Benjamin Franklin to seriously consider reincarnation. There are plenty of scientific truisms taken for granted which we can never experience. The same people who tell us one year the universe is X billion years old and the next decade radically increase that number with equal certainty are also the ones we rely on to have an accurate idea of what other life exists in that universe and how that life expresses itself in matter. This is all to say that the modern scientific worldview strengthens its narrative with plenty of inferences and guesswork to fill the gaps which is why argumentative atheists often come off as contradictory, seeing as they cling to their disbelief much like the religious person holds strongly to their own. For instance, to imagine that death gives way to nothingness actually cannot be imagined. Nothingness and non-existence by definition does not exist. All we can ever experience and imagine is existence itself. You will always exist because all of the aspects that make up you have to be alive in order to make it. One day, should the scientific worldview finally merge with the spiritual, we may, with much greater relaxation, finally admit that spiritual beliefs are reinforced by experience, much more than the alleged scientific claims about our place in the universe. In brief, let's build ground against the scientific arguments which might be thrown at us for considering reincarnation or for that matter, considering the spiritual nature of reality that would give way to reincarnation. We should ask, is there a limit to time? If there were, what would be the odds we just happen to be alive right now? If all the matter and energy in the universe is constant, then it could not have arrived from inconstancy. You cannot identify a universal law if in fact it is not universal and not a law. What, for instance, is the knowingness inside the DNA that works to adapt and prolong an organism? Why should a clump of moving matter, unable to ascribe a meaning to its own existence, 
somehow make a decision for it to be transformed so that it survives. Random chance variation cannot and will never account for this. Again, what is the thing inside the DNA that makes a decision for the benefit of the organism? Now ask that question about the first instance of a living organism, which, what, we are supposed to imagine happened by chance and all alone on this little sliver of a planet amidst an unknowingly large universe? We need to add under the definition given for God that it is the intelligence which imprints upon the DNA the means to make decisions. Decisions, it would appear, may have been pre-coded into the cells from the start. Or, maybe not from the start, but forever, if biological organisms have always existed throughout the universe. If that's the case, the universe should have a ready-made system for biological life forms to flourish. This will be more interesting to consider as we discuss the idea of pre-birth existence. Now, some people ask, what is the meaning of life? with a nihilistic and cynical tinge. But the best answer to this question, what is the meaning of life, is so that we can give it meaning. And not just give it meaning one time, but infinitely. As an immortal soul progressing and contracting and expanding through infinity, we are likewise capable of ascribing infinite meanings to the universe. Another realization which dogmatism would restrain. If the cynic supposes human life is futile and without purpose, it makes perfect sense in an infinite universe, because infinity implies every perspective has to exist somewhere. Another resurgent argument against God is, if God is real, how is it that evil even exists? But you cannot deflate the purposes of an infinite God, of which you are a part of, By saying, evil exists, therefore God isn't real, or if he is, then something is wrong. This limited viewpoint again forgets that, if God were ever real in the first place, then the souls exploring his infinite terrain should, at some point, also create a lifetime in which we now find ourselves. A lifetime where souls have forgotten their nature and experience the illusion of separateness. Our world is already locked into the symbolic dance of light and dark and life and death. Is it not already encoded into that narrative, writ large across nature's processes, the hints of a greater underlying truth? That where light fades, so does it return once more. Nothing is easier than for a boring person to give you their boring understanding of the entirety of the universe. If person A and person B pick up the same book, they will leave thinking equally A or B things about that book. Such it is with life. Of course, there are various natural examples that could readily be argued to hint at reincarnation, albeit if those symbols are negotiated into meaning through a spiritual lens. The lapse of awareness in dreams, for instance, as one flits to and from the dream world, is not an experience that can be captured by the intellect. It points to a greater internal life and demonstrates that to have quasi-physical experiences does not require the usual body-mind awareness we experience in daily awakened life. Symbolic of a cyclic return to form are also the repeating cycles of the moon, the daily return of the sun, and the annual death and rebirth cycle of the seasons. The three states of water demonstrate the changeability of a vital substance, which, in a few minutes, under the right conditions, could go from ice to water to vapor and back to ice again. And water will never be a tired or cliché framework to look through. Water doesn't go away, however much it might be able to be tainted by an additional substance. And energy can never be created or destroyed, as goes the first law of thermodynamics. We will find shortly how intimately related reincarnation is to karma, or at least our idea of karma, being the influencer for future incarnations. But there is a lot of confusion around karma, and its meaning can be twisted to provide excuses for why we are not where we'd like to be in life, or why it is right not to help others in theirs. Karma originally meant action. Therefore, it's not entirely accurate to look at things in terms of paying off the accumulated karmic debt. However, the reason these distinct definitions might have blurred is not difficult to suggest. 
because action has consequences. In that way, understanding karma as action and taking this deeper allows us to be more intentional with our actions and see our actions as having power beyond our physical circumstances. Our actions affect the entirety of our experienced world. Stacking up negatively charged actions will obviously reap negatively charged results. Put simply, we read in the Hindu Upanishads, Now as a man is like this or like that, according as he acts and according as he behaves, so will he be. A man of good acts will become good, a man of bad acts, bad. He becomes pure by pure deeds, bad by bad deeds. We should also not confuse a soul's theme with karmic debt. Theme might imply the idea of a reoccurring challenge the soul chooses to have opportunities to overcome, implying a growth is to be achieved. Karmic debt from past lives should not imply a disempowerment which might unduly burden those who otherwise do have the power to change. Is looking at an impoverished individual in deep pain and saying, well, they must be paying back their karmic debt, actually an accurate way of looking at it? Or is it the kind of lazy application which allows a caste system to take shape? It is true that people must change themselves to change, but it is also true other people can help and guide and teach and provide tools to make it more likely for that person to make positive change. Imagine a house notoriously known as haunted because some tragic event occurred. A tragic action has distorted the energies there. But other actions can lift that energy or exercise it away. Other actions can cleanse it. This is all to say the notion of karmic debt too often strips personal responsibility and our own presence from an event, and suspends it into that abstract realm encapsulated in the cliché that everything happens for a reason. Of course everything happens for a reason. Of course we live in the world of cause and effect. It doesn't mean when we can't figure out these reasons, we resort to the idea of karmic debt to explain it. But I don't want to stray too far. Karmic debt is not all without merit, but it becomes far less solid an explanation for things when we say our debt was stacked up in a previous life. Because, in fact, the term reincarnation itself is flawed. Same with the term past life. This is due to the illusory nature of time. Now is actually the only singular moment there has ever been and ever will be. Tomorrow will never come. You will never leave the now. By all means, go ahead and try. Time is merely a measure of the motion of celestial objects relative to the measurer's time-space circumstance. Therefore, to view reincarnation with the perspective of a linear sequence of events or a chronology of lifetimes would not be how the mechanics of incarnations actually function. Considering now is the only moment, all of the lifetimes we have ever had as a soul have to exist right now. So it is not that one soul reincarnates, but rather that it has multiple simultaneous incarnations, each operating with their independent point of views, potentially connected with each other based on proximity or some esoteric variable we cannot yet grasp. Therefore, if reincarnation is actually simultaneous incarnations, how can we incur a linear karmic debt? The question is worth spending much more time on, but let's begin to consult the ancients to see how various schools throughout history have put stock in this concept and refined or otherwise muddied the water of the entire idea. Reincarnation is not all divorced from the popular Christian notion of a second coming of Christ. But of course, most Christians seem constitutionally incapable of applying the term Christ to anyone but Jesus, not imagining that this second coming or Christ consciousness is an awakening of that same divine awareness exhibited by Jesus inside themselves. Concepts of reincarnation were not lost on the philosopher Synesius, born around 372 AD, who was a Greek Neoplatonist who later converted to Christianity and became a bishop of Ptolemaeus in Libya. He writes that the gods descend according to orderly periods of time in order to impart a benevolent impulse onto the republics of mankind, especially through the tribes of heroes who align with them. 
Quote, this heroic tribe is, as it were, a colony from the gods, established here in order that this terrene abode may not be left destitute of a better nature. He goes further to explain an Egyptian teaching about the gods deciding to descend during a negatively charged period in civilization, much like the great Hindu teacher Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, quote, I produce myself among creatures whenever there is a decline of virtue and an insurrection of vice and injustice in the world. You might recall the term bodhisattva as well, defined plainly as a Buddhist deity who has attained the highest level of enlightenment, but who delays their entry into paradise in order to help the incarnate souls on earth. Many have decided that Jesus alluded to reincarnation in Matthew 11 when he speaks of John the Baptist, quote, He is the Elijah who was to come. There are certainly Jewish rabbis and philosophers who hold with the notion of a returning soul as well, not to mention their very own Messiah from the Davidic line. Take the Jewish historian Flavius Josephus, writing in the first century AD. Josephus was a general in a campaign against the Roman commander Vespasian, and without his writings much of our understanding of the early Jewish sects would not be so clearly known. Do you not know, writes Josephus, that those who depart out of this life according to the law of nature enjoy eternal flame, that their houses and their posterity are sure, that their souls are pure and obedient, and obtain a most holy place in heaven, from whence, in the revolution of ages, they are again sent into pure bodies, while the souls of those whose hands have acted madly against themselves are received by the darkest place in Hades. But where the Western religious movements could be said to contain sparse, at times chancy passages related to reincarnation, those of the East, like Buddhism and Hinduism, come to us with a well-established understanding of returning souls and the need for their liberation. For Hinduism, the canon Katha Upanishad, dated roughly to the 5th century BC, is a collection of philosophical poems being a conversation between the young sage Nachikitas, and Yama, god of death. In this text, Nachikitas has gone to the house of death, and Yama gives him three wishes. In one of the teachings, the god of death is made to say, quote, The knower is never born nor dies, nor is it from anywhere, nor did it become anything, unborn, eternal, immemorial. This ancient is not slain when the body is slain, smaller than small, greater than great, This self is hidden in the heart of man, in all beings that shines not forth, but is perceived by the piercing subtle soul of the subtle sighted. Understanding this great Lord the self, bodiless in bodies, stable among unstable, the wise man cannot grieve. Later the same Yama compares this self to the Lord of the chariot, the body being the chariot and the soul the charioteer. This is a similar analogy as used by Plato in his Timaeus Dialogue, which you can find extracts from in our video on Greek cosmology. One of the most popular texts in the Hindu religion, being an episode in the larger Mahabharata, is the Bhagavad Gita, which is a dialogue between Prince Arjuna and Krishna, an incarnation of the god Vishnu. Krishna here is teaching Arjuna or reinforcing the fact that he should not mourn or grieve, not for beings slain in battle or otherwise. Only by the lack of spiritual understanding would he do so, and thus expounding on the soul's nature, Krishna says, Unentered, unassailed, unharmed, untouched, immortal, all-arriving, stable, sure, invisible, ineffable, by word and thought uncompassed, ever all itself, thus is the soul declared, How wilt thou then, knowing it so, grieve when thou should not grieve? How, if thou hearest that the man new dead is, like the man new born, still living man, one same existent spirit, wilt thou weep? The end of birth is death. The end of death is birth. This is ordained. Now the Vedanta philosophy, or one of the six orthodox schools of Hinduism, as taught by Sankarachyara, does not encourage escaping from rebirth. As the Vedanta Dictionary states, quote, a series of improving lives provides for an increase in the capacity to be aware of one's essential freedom in all circumstances. Indeed, the realization of one's freedom 
has to be gained in those circumstances, not by any escape or release, in which there would be no overcoming. Therefore the experience of something which we discover does not represent our excitement or our true expression, offers us another example of what we do not prefer. Looking at it with this mindset transmutes every apparent failure or mistake into an opportunity, giving us yet more examples of what we do not want to experience, so that what we should be experiencing and embodying becomes clearer. This process being a challenge would mandate the growth of one's soul, and therefore the soul has overcome its challenge rather than escaped from it. This switches the emphasis from being a soul fated for any number of windfall punishments, seeking ultimate release from the sufferings of mortal life, to a soul who can choose at some level to explore whatever challenge encapsulated the theme of the Incarnation, a challenge the soul might return to time and again in order to overcome. In certain teachings of Buddhism, we find that for a Buddha to reach a state of being worthy of such a title implies a spiritual refinement over many lifetimes. I, for one, hesitate to view this from a linear chronology, which would mean my soul is now an accumulation of lives lived in previous centuries. Whereas the nonlinear perspective suggests that, in reaching a state of enlightenment, so to speak, I am connecting with all the simultaneous existing lives lived out by my oversoul, who also resonate at the enlightened frequency. Dr. Edward Kahns, a Buddhist scholar and translator, who published works through the 1920s, writes, Numerous Buddhas appear successively at suitable intervals. Buddhism sees itself not as the record of the sayings of one man who lived in northern India about 500 BC. His teachings are represented as the uniform result of an often repeated eruption of spiritual reality into this world. The spiritual reality of immortality, therefore, is not a thing to be achieved or earned. It is the default state of consciousness. But that our experiences and our actions now in this lifetime will affect, to some degree, the immediate post-death experience is something we find established from ancient Egypt to Tibet. In a concluding passage of the so-called Tibetan Book of the Dead, traditionally created in the 8th century by Padmasambhaya, a mystic and prophet, in what is now far northern Pakistan, we find more allusions to this life and a next life. Through the power of this authentic, precious jewel, all one's needs and wishes in this life can be manifested, and in the next life Buddhahood can certainly be achieved. The pivotal figure of classic philosophical Taoism, Chong Su, living in the late 4th century BC, writes of those ancients whose memory of a pre-birth existence was not clouded at birth. Put in Greek terms, these ancients had not sipped from the river Lethe and the waters of forgetfulness. Quote, the true men of old did not dream when they slept, had no anxiety when they awoke, and did not care that their food should be pleasant. Composedly they went and came. They did not forget what their beginning had been, and they did not inquire into what their end would be. They accepted and rejoiced in it. Such were they who are called the true men. We should not fail to mention the clear establishment of metempsychosis among the Greek Orphics, those followers of the teachings of the sage and poet Orpheus. Metempsychosis is the supposed transmigration at death of a soul of a human being into a new body of the same or a different species. In 35 gold tablets or gold foils, containing extracts from Orpheus's poetry and directions for navigating the underworld found in Sicily, Rome, Crete, Thessaly, Macedonia, and more, and dating mostly from the 4th century BC and as late as the 2nd century AD, we find inscriptions about escaping a circle of grief or a cycle of reincarnation, an Orphic attribute that Plato also knew about. All available evidence suggests the Orphic system maintained the belief of a soul's immortality and some conception of reincarnation, which inevitably binds to earlier Pythagorean and later Platonic teachings. For a thousand years from the time of Heraclitus of Ephesus, there are Greek-speaking writers who alluded to souls formerly departed from the world returning to newborn bodies. No real survey of the believers in reincarnation would be complete without addressing the ancient Egyptians whose afterlife seemed always to look similar to the present life, implying a variance of our typical understanding of reincarnation. 
Dr. Margaret Murray, a distinguished Egyptologist who worked with Flinders Petrie for many years, cites evidence for a pre-Persian invasion, native Egyptian understanding of reincarnation. The Ka names of the first two kings of the 20th dynasty show this belief clearly. Amanimat the first name was he who repeats births, and Sinsasert the first's name was he whose births live. In the 19th dynasty, the Ka name of Seteki the first was repeater of births, and it was by this epithet that he was addressed by the god Amun at Karnak. The Egyptian Book of the Dead, or the Book of Going Forth by Day, includes references of souls coming again and the like. This Book of the Dead, traditionally believed to have been written by Thoth, the Egyptian god of wisdom and scribes and much more, is the most celebrated Egyptian scripture. From the papyrus of Ani, dated around 1450 BC, is the following passage from the Book of the Dead. Homage to thee, Osiris, O governor of those who are in Amenti, who maketh mortals to be born again, who renewest thy youth. More than a thousand years later, out of Greco-Roman Egypt, comes the various texts which make up the Corpus Hermeticum. The Corpus Hermeticum are the foundational documents of the Hermetic tradition and are a group of 17 texts maintained to have been compiled or written in Egypt by unknown authors before the 3rd century AD. The attributed author for each book in the corpus is none other than Hermes Trismegistus, a fusion of the Greek god Hermes and the ancient Egyptian god Thoth. This class of literature is contemporary with the teachings of Neoplatonism, Christianity, and the various schools piled under the category of Gnosticism. Whether or not the corpus contains legitimate echoes of ancient Egyptian religion has been the subject of centuries of boiling debates. Nevertheless, new evidence shows how earlier Thoth cult literature resembles later Hermetic literature, in that either Thoth or Hermes is the attributed generic divine author and the texts are mostly dialogues between mentor and pupil. We'll revisit this more in our upcoming series on the cult of Hermes. In the book of the corpus titled The Key, we have Isis instructing Horus about the manner of his soul's departure from the body. To one question, Isis responds, O great and marvelous scion of the illustrious Osiris, think not that souls on quitting the body mix themselves confusedly in the vague immensity and become dispersed in the universal and infinite spirit without the power to return into bodies, to preserve their identity, or to seek again their primeval abode. There have been some scholars who attempt to show the ideas of reincarnation came into Egypt after the Persian conquering in the 6th century BC. A rather flimsy idea which no one would have a basis for if not for a legitimate doctrine of rebirth already found in ancient Persia. Of course, the dominant pre-Islamic religion of ancient Persia was none other than Zoroastrianism, a religion based on the teachings of the prophet Zarathustra. Although Zoroastrian literature is fragmentary, there is quite a great deal more of it than you might at first think. The primary collection of Zoroastrian texts are in the Avesta, where we find the tradition that born from a future Zarathustra, a certain Seoshant will come, at a time where evil is defeated and worldwide harmony and happiness is achieved. The Neoplatonist philosopher Porphyry, living from around 234 to 305 AD, writes of the Persians, quote, The dogma with all of them which ranks as the first is this, that there is a transmigration of souls, and this they also appear to indicate in the mysteries of Mithra. Now in the Zen Devesta itself, the Gathas are hymns regarded as sacred utterances of Zarathustra. One stanza reads, Souls whose inner light continues dim, who have not yet beheld the light of truth, unto this home of falsehood shall return, surrounded by false leaders, egos false, by those who think and speak and act untrue. This indicates the return of mostly sinners to the earth life until this light of truth is beheld and embodied. Also in a compendium of teachings of Persian schools and sects called the Dabistan, we also glimpse the ancient Persian belief in reincarnation and liberation. Souls which stood out for their good deeds and works would unite with the sun after death, or travel to another star more suited to their affinities. And those who aren't too locked to the abode of earth through selfish and worldly desires, but are imperfectly good, go from body to body, 
life to life until their liberation is achieved. An allegory of reincarnation has likewise been found in the Greek myth of Psyche, the goddess personifying the soul, from whose name we derive the psyche in psychology and so forth. A symbol for Psyche is a butterfly, which fits neatly with the soul's metamorphosis from caterpillar body to the winged body of the butterfly, a marveling miracle in nature. We could spend some time retracing the serpent symbolism of rebirth and the image of the serpent shedding its skin or consuming itself in a circle. But few other myth creatures typify reincarnation so much as the phoenix, where in Egypt and Arabia this kind of bird is reborn out of the fire what consumes its previous flesh. Among early indigenous peoples in Africa, we find reincarnation particularly developed, long before the white man or the Muslim had chance to influence their religion. Edward Burnett Taylor, at times regarded as the father of anthropology, made clear that the doctrine of reincarnation was ancient among the Yorubas of West Africa, much the same among the Edo-speaking tribes. Dr. E.G. Perinder, former professor of the Comparative Study of Religion at the University of London, wrote in his book African Traditional Religion, quote, Reincarnation to most Africans is a good thing. It is a return to the sunlit world for a future period of invigorating life. Various phrases are used to describe reincarnation. One West African people called it the shooting forth of a branch, and another a reoccurring cycle. An entire essay could be devoted to the different African peoples who held to a belief of rebirth, much like the early ancient Europeans such as the Teutonics, Celts of Gaul, and the prose writers of Scandinavia. Tribes among the Native Americans can certainly be included, as is alluded to in the story of the Indian teacher Hiawatha, put into poetic verse by the American poet Longfellow, based on the writings of Henry Schoolcraft an American geologist and ethnologist known for his studies of the American Indians. In the last verses of Longfellow's Song of Hiawatha, we also read, I am going, O my people, on a long and distant journey. Many moons and many winters will have come and will have vanished before I come again to see you. The earliest ever record of American Indian reincarnation dates back to 1612 from the account of William Strachey, whose writings are among the primary sources for early history of English colonization. Strachey wrote concerning the Powhatan of Virginia that the Powhatan Indians believed after death the soul would dissolve and die and come into a woman's womb again, and so be a newborn unto the world. Jesuit missionaries also recorded, among the Huron and other Iroquois, beliefs in reincarnation beginning in the 1630s. In summary, we have now offered traces of a teaching of rebirth and reincarnation spanning many ancient religions, and by no means is this a fraction of the exhaustive accounts we would have to present to showcase the whole of it. I will hazard a guess that none of this will be moving or sufficient for the controlling portion of modern academics who specialize in one or another niche of religious belief. I hope I'm terribly wrong. But in my limited experience, Skeptical academics steer clear of researching the material of those outside their increasingly expensive and circular council of truth-sayers. But now I'm catching myself, speaking in generalizations about that loathsome portion of scholars who would deny any alleged proof of their own soul, even if they were sledgehammered by the seventh ecstasy of nirvana itself. But recovering a more agreeable mood... As shown, there have been and there certainly are agents in academia unafraid to carry that lonely torch which shines on the suggestion that reincarnation is not so incredible after all. In walks Ian Stevenson, a Canadian-born American psychiatrist and founder-director of the Division of Perceptual Studies at the University of Virginia School of Medicine, where Stevenson was a professor for 50 years. After being named the Chair of Psychiatry at the University in 1957 and receiving a bundle of funding for his deep interest in studying the alleged past lives recalled by children, Professor Stevenson embarked on a full-time study of the subject for the next 40 years, and his results, despite being the resurgent victim of militant skepticism, yielded 3,000 studied cases of alleged past life remembrance. To paint the picture of a typical case out of Stevenson's research, let's say there is a child in Sri Lanka 
who, having never traveled out of her hometown, begins telling her mother about her family in a past life, her old hometown, her former siblings, and the manner of her death, even the place of her burial, and the reason why she has a birthmark on her leg, wherein another life she was beaten. Stevenson would pick up the details of this case and go out to verify the facts, returning not with 100% accuracy, but close enough accuracy to warrant the idea that this child could not be making up what she had said. How could she remember so many names and places even though in this life she had not traveled or encountered any one of them? Stevenson once wrote, Reincarnation, at least as I conceive it, does not nullify what we know about evolution and genetics. It suggests, however, that there may be two streams of evolution, the biological one and a personal one, and that during terrestrial lives these streams may interact. If you haven't heard of Stevenson, you surely won't be hearing about him soon. And should you care to look into him or others who actually apply the scientific method with an open mind on this subject, you will find a wealth of anomalous data suggestive of far more to the story than the consciousness-is-only-brain-activity materialists would ever like to pursue, seeing as they like to keep their jobs and reputations and get published when they can. Because I guess that's what some careers in academia are for these days. Achieving reputation, obeying the rules, publishing in the esteemed journals, and keeping a job. As Stevenson said, the wish not to believe can influence as strongly as the wish to believe. In conclusion, wherever a mature spiritual tradition exists, so too do we find the subject of reincarnation, in itself reincarnated in the scriptural and oral accounts of different civilizations, with different gods, prophets, cities, and languages, who have yet all treasures to offer to the language of nature herself. In the words of the great American Benjamin Franklin, Finding myself to exist in the world, I believe I shall in some shape or other always exist, and with all the inconveniences human life is liable to, I shall not object to a new edition of mine, hoping, however, that the errata of the last may be corrected. If you like the work we do on the channel, please like and subscribe, and consider supporting my Patreon through the link below in the description. Thank you all. See you soon. Thank you.